Hi, everybody. Welcome. We're going to start in a few minutes. Go grab a drink. Go get something to keep you moistened. And uh, we're going to start here in a few minutes. And I'm talking kind of just making noise with my mouth so people out there might hear me. Lightning Talks 2019, starting in a few minutes.
Hello, SSC. Welcome to Lightning Talks 2019, our third annual Lightning Talks session. Uh, my name is Rich Briggs. And I'm uh, Simon Engelhart. And uh, our job is to get out of the way. Before we do, we want to let you know a little bit about how this works. Lightning Talks are a terrifying mix of high speed slides. Um, an attempt to teach you something, but mainly attitude coming your direction from up here. And um, these people have worked hard to prepare, and uh, they're going to send some energy your way. You send it right back, and go get one of these if, if you need one. Um, so 15-second slides automatically clicking forward. And uh, with that, I think we're just going to start. So Cy, click that. We have a button here. This is the magic button. Oh, back it up, back it up, back it up. Uh, yeah, now we're, we're good at this. OK. Um, first speaker, Adam Pascali, Evolution of Rapid Response. Are you ready, Adam? Yep, let's go. So I'm going to talk to you about the evolution of our rapid response in Australia at our observatory. Um, a lot of things uh, have changed, but what one thing hasn't changed is sleepless nights and uh, constant questions about why is the magnitude always changing when you publish something. But it all starts with data collection, and this is how it didn't start for us, but obviously we need to uh, get data quickly. And it didn't used to be very quick because you'd have to put it on records like this. So our early data collection was smoked paper drums. So I don't know if any of you have used them before, but basically you'd have to go out there and collect them and then run them through a fixing fluid and, and then wait about an hour before, you, before it dries, before you can analyze it. So we do that uh, you know, every couple of days. And they're fragile, but they're really cool. But if you get them wrong, you can get them smudged or really smudged. So it was a problem. So then we started doing uh, after doing that, we had data telemetry, which was really great. So we used to carry around pages and really cool belt clips to, to have them in. Um, so we would get these notifications in the middle of the night, and we're going, what, what are these numbers? So especially at 2 a.m., you're going, oh, I have to decode that station. And, that. and then we'd have to let everyone else who had a pager know that we're responding to it. So unlike Nick Fury in Captain Marvel, we couldn't send messages from them, so we'd have to ring somebody and tell them, uh, this is what we're doing. I'm checking it out. Not chicken, get out. That's what actually went out. <laughs> so we'd still have to manually analyze this data. Um, so we're there, and there I am sitting there 20 years ago. It's, oh, I look the same. It's amazing when you look 50 when you're 20. So, so we'd still sit there and uh, process that data manually. Then we had auto location software, which would then send us messages on our Nokia 3210s um, and tell us where it was. So that sped up the process a little bit um, to, to get the response going. But again, we still had to punch in all of that data and it took some time to get a location. So in Australia, we don't have big earthquakes very often, so we have little ones, so we have to be able to uh, locate them automatically. Now, the problem is when the yeah, little ones still get felt, people react badly to them and make fun of us, but they don't automatically pick you know, P waves really nicely in, on, on small events. So we had to rethink the way our software uh, was working. So, okay, we're moving from laptops to portable devices. How do we more quickly locate earthquakes? So we came up with an idea. So can we use one station to locate an earthquake? Well, we know we can, but can you do it efficiently. So we've got this thing, okay, you pick a P and an S, you know you've got a distance to an earthquake, but then you have multiple stations, so you don't really know exactly where it is. So what if we just pick one P and one S? We get that distance to the earthquake, but then what if we move the earthquake around that radius and see how it affects all the other seismograms? So we can just do that really quickly, and we get a quick confirmation of our uh, location and magnitude. So that really works to give you the confidence to uh, you know, produce a notification, which leaves plenty of time for the really important stuff, which is media. So, <laughs> so, and everyone knows that if you don't do the media, it, it, you'll die, because like, you'd rather be Anne Hesh in Volcano than the field person who went out and died, or you know, Paul Giamatti in San Andreas other than the field person who went out and died. So you've got to do your media, otherwise you're dead. So the other media is, <laughs> that kills you is uh, Twitter and Facebook. So you get all these notifications coming out. I felt it here, I felt it there. There's all this information. So there's a lot of pressure to get information out quickly. Um, so that's one of the sort of more modern challenges we have. 
but these systems help to give us confidence. We think about what we do. We can get those messages out quickly. Problem is with earthquake data, it's not dynamic. It, it's, there's nothing leading up to it. So when you've got um, you know, cyclones or volcanoes, you've got these uh, things that are happening to build up uh, to a crescendo. Uh, but when an earthquake happens, it's happened and then you've got to share that data. And visually, um, it's hard to do that. These sorts of things, these animations of wave propagation are great because they're really good engagement, but it does take time. Earthquake early warning is the next step. So obviously people now know that's one of the good things they got right in San Andreas was teaching people not to be in the doorways, be under, under the tables. So that's the one thing that we can get out really quickly. But then there's these new systems like the, the MyShake app uh, and, the, and Shake Maps that are generated pretty quickly as well. So this will help you know, data engagement. Obviously, we're not having a lot of those in Australia, but um, it's, it's still a really useful thing. So in conclusion, just think about all this data. These, you young fellows who are out there doing research, all that data took a lot of work to do. And so just appreciate your data analysts. Uh, you, you know what they've gone through to get that data into your earthquakes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Adam. I think we may have set our M max, the upper energy limit there. Um, so there's a challenge for everyone else who's coming afterwards. Um, but it gives me uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, our current society president, um, Sue Hoff. So, Sue, are you ready? No. Okay. <laughs> now are you ready? <laughs> so Adam is a tough act to follow, and in case there was any doubt, the one sketchy talk that I referred to at lunchtime was this one. So I'm going to be talking about uh, century-old induced earthquakes in Los Angeles. Uh, we think about induced earthquakes maybe as something new. Um, okay, it, boy, it took forever. Uh, yeah. we've seen, but, um, and we've seen these one-year hazard maps from the USGS looking at the, induced, the hazard from induced earthquakes in the central US. If you look at the fine print, it's basically based on the presumption that there's no significant induced earthquakes in California, which has always been our understanding. So at any time and place, the identification of induced earthquakes uh, relies on several basic lines of evidence, which you can read here if you're a speed reader, and that they're basically what I'm going to be talking about. So I'm going to be talking about Los Angeles. Uh, people may not realize the extent to which Los Angeles in its earliest days was an oil town. Its growth was fueled by the discovery of oil starting at the end of the 19th century, moving forward into the early 20th century. This talk is a preponderance of the evidence kind of thing. So this is exhibit one, that as cumulative production, the black line ramped up in the LA basin, the seismic moment release measured two different ways, shown in green, ramped up right along with it. If you look between 1900 and 1933, there is a spatial and temporal association between all of, essentially all of the significant earthquakes and oil production in the various fields, um, as shown here. Uh, one interesting example is the 1929 Whittier earthquake, magnitude five-ish, all reasonable estimates of location, place it within at most a few kilometers of the active part of the Santa Fe Springs oil field. They're shown in the gray squares. In this case, we have good production data. Produ the field was discovered, production ramped up. There was a shallow three and a half. The field started to be depleted. The well was deepened and this magnitude five happened right as the production peaked from that deeper well. Uh, what about Long Beach? The, still to this day, the biggest earthquake in the LA Basin proper, could it have been induced? Uh, for this earthquake, we don't have, I've, I haven't found detailed uh, production data, uh, but the, oh, and I, while I'm here, I will put in a plug. Uh, there's a poster with, that I have with Rob Graves. It presents on Friday, presenting a first ever synoptic investigation of the ground motions from this event which is an interesting question, apart from the question of whether or not it was induced. But uh, the, the evidence that it might have been induced is, um, there's the chronology, the field was discovered, it started to be depleted, a well was deepened in 32, for the first time also drilled directionally offshore, the earthquake happened nine months later, essentially right on top of, of where that well was. Moving forward from 38 to 44, there was a cluster of earthquakes in the Southwest LA Basin that occurred right as production ramped up from the Wilmington and our other fields. So this is exhibit four. Again, there's production in there and earthquakes. There was a spattering of earthquakes that you can explain, cannot explain as aftershocks of Long Beach, but they do correlate with this rapid increase in production. 
So uh, what about physical mechanism? It's been known for decades that primary uncompensated oil production will perturb subsurface, stretches, subsurface stresses. There's a classic sketch by uh, Paul Fiegel and then the modern version shown here. And so there's a plausible physical model for these earthquakes in the southwest LA basin. You're pulling oil out from getting down to two, three kilometers. You start to perturb the stresses significantly at seismogenic depths of five, five to six kilometers. Uh, exhibit six is what happened after uh, the mid-40s. There, there were core pressure effects that we don't try to model that presumably inhibited ruptures. Uh, but then in the late 50s, there was a start of widespread water flooding, which would have balanced the pressures, and the LA Basin got quiet. Kern County, I'm falling behind, uh, 1952, moving out of the LA Basin. Could it have been induced? It was one of the biggest 20th century earthquakes in California. Um, and by now, it starts to be a, a familiar refrain without going into details. The Wheeler Ridge field was discovered. The production was shallow. A well was deepened, in this case, all the way down to three kilometers. Production started, and the earthquake happened a month, or not, sorry, three months later. Last exhibit is the 1925 Santa Barbara earthquake, and at this point, we can pretend it's a Queen concert, and you can sing along with me. Um, <laughs> there was shallow production in the Summerland field. A deep test well was, was drilled, um, and the earthquake happened a month later. So conclusions. Uncompensated primary production can perturb subsurface stresses as the wells, and which has the potential to induce earthquakes. What matters, location, 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 proximity to active fields, but also the depth. As the production got deeper, you start to perturb the stresses at seismogenic depths. And there's a whole list of actual papers with actual details. Thank you. Give it up for our president. Our society is a happening society. Next speaker is Max Schneider. Max, are you ready? I'm ready. Max is ready. Go. Hi, I'm Max Schneider. I'm a PhD student in statistics at the University of Washington, just up the road here in Seattle. And I work on uh, seismicity modeling for aftershock forecasts. And anytime I tell people I work in that research field, they ask me, when is the next earthquake going to happen? And I always respond, tomorrow, because that stops those silly questions. <laughs> so we can't predict earthquakes, but we can forecast in a probabilistic manner aftershocks. And that's pretty important, because we know that aftershocks can cause additional hazard um, to already weakened buildings and structures that were weakened by the main shock. So um, recent aftershock sequences have, have also underlined the importance that forecasts could have had in those areas to reduce the seismic risk. Um, so there's different audiences and different uh, users of aftershock forecasts, which are being increasingly put out, including by the USGS. Um, one of them are emergency managers, and a focus group of emergency managers has shown that they value aftershock forecasts the most of all seismological model products. So we should get these out to our users, but we already know that all of our forecasts will have uncertainty and that we need to depict that to characterize the forecast completely. So there's lots of ways to do that in the literature. Authors use um, visual encodings like transparency or additional layers of patterns and hatching uh, or maybe multiple realizations from the forecast model to show how uncertain the forecast is at various locations on the map. Well, so which of these are actually the most effective? Which can do the job so that people use the, the uncertainty in the forecast in the decisions that they make with it? Well, it turns out that visualization is not a one-size-fits-all problem. And there's a Seattle joke somewhere in that visual as well. Um, so in order to test the effectiveness of a visualization, we need to know what it's being used for. So I spoke to four users of, or hopefully potential users, of aftershock forecasts. These are emergency managers in the Pacific Northwest. And I found out that, well, first of all, they seem to really care about uncertainty in ways that maybe we don't realize. So this came up um, in every interview in various forms. So we should probably show them the uncertainty. Um, and that it also, uh, the uncertainty and, and their uses of model products in general um, has two common use cases. So the first is to guide situational awareness uh, on the ground of their crews and other people that they're providing information to. The second is uh, resource allocation in a limited resource environment. 
So I boiled those down to two communication goals that an uncertainty visualization should have. So if a UV is good, it tells us where an aftershock is likely and where no aftershock is likely. And it can also tell us where a bad surprise might be happening. So uh, the forecast is low, but the uncertainty is so high that we could have an aftershock there after all. Um, and to study this, I, I worked with cognitive psychologists to develop a human subjects experiment. No, no, not that kind of human subjects experiment. We ran an online study um, with users from the US West Coast to, uh, to test whether three different uncertainty visualization designs that we came up with would have different outcomes than the control, which is just this uh, forecast map shown without the uncertainty, which is what we're showing today to people. So uh, which of these uncertainty visualizations could actually outperform or, or have different response outcomes than this? So the premise is that an effective UV is one that can be read quickly, but also accurately, um, and one where if you're making a prediction about the future based on that UV, that you'll incorporate the uncertainty into your prediction. So if I ask you where the aftershock's going to happen next week, that the, you'll take the uncertainty in the UV into account when making your prediction. So we came up with four tasks for this experiment. The first two are map reading tasks, where we ask users to um, give the forecast and certainty level for a marked location on the map. We ask users to click on a location that has a certain forecast or certainty level, so this kind of spatial action task is missing from this literature. And we also have prediction tasks, one where we um, ask them to consider two marked areas, which one will they predict to have more aftershocks, and then one where they select a zone on the forecast map where they predict most of the aftershocks will occur. So we just piloted this experiment right before Christmas. I'm analyzing the pilot data right now, and I'd love to get your feedback or input. If you have questions, suggestions, shoot me an email or find me at the conference. Thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you, Max. And now we all know what to say to our taxi driver when they ask the obvious question when they find out we're at a seismology conference. And so next, we're gonna to go to Emily Wallen. Emily, are you ready? I am ready. You can go. All right, let's go. So hello, everyone, I'm Emily. Um, I've been a postdoc at the USGS for three years now. I'm really excited to announce that I'm moving to the Albuquerque Seismo Lab soon. I've got to work with a lot of awesome people on expanding and densifying seismic networks in Nepal and Myanmar. So we know that this is a zone of extremely high hazard. We're sitting right where India is ramming into Eurasia. So we have a huge zone of earthquake hazard along that Himalayan front and also in the Indochina Peninsula as it's sort of rotating out and getting extruded. This is also a zone of extremely high risk. In the Kathmandu Valley, we have two and a half million people living in a rapidly urbanizing area with very few building codes. We also have uh, 15 million people living in Myanmar's three largest cities directly on top of a strike slip fault. Okay, huge demonstration of the earthquake risk in this region happened uh, almost exactly four years ago. The Gorkha earthquake killed 9,000 people and injured 23,000, but this earthquake was also very surprising in that certain areas of the valley were much less damaged than we expected. This is partially due to the source, but also partially due to the site response. We didn't have many observations in that area. We would like to have more so that we can better understand how the basin responds and eventually improve hazard maps and eventually build safer buildings. Before the quake happened, the USGS and our local partner had already installed several strong motion stations to try and uh, capture the earthquake that we knew was coming. Uh, after the quake, we installed additional stations and there's been a focus on low cost instrumentation so we get more observations for our dollar. Uh, these uh, low cost instruments started out as part of the quake catcher network. This is a really good idea. It's a low cost sensor, you just plug it in get ground motion observations, but the problem is in Kathmandu, it's really difficult to find a host computer that's always turned on and plugged into the internet. The Raspberry Shake came along a couple years later, and this has solved that problem of finding a host computer because it's built around a Raspberry Pi computer. It also streams data to us in Miniseed, which is really nice for analysis. Done a lot of work with colleagues at the Albuquerque Seismo Lab to assess the performance of these instruments, and the answer to this question, do they perform well enough for our network, in the case of Nepal is overwhelmingly yes. So in June of 2018, we brought uh, 10 units over to Nepal. We did a lot of training with our amazing local partner, NSET, to train engineers and IT professionals to install these things. We got to install two units next to research grade accelerometers so that we could do some quality control and redundancy 
on these things. We got lucky just a couple days after installation. We recorded a small earthquake 50 kilometers west of Kathmandu. You can see that the data from the Raspberry Shake compares really nicely with the NetQuake's research grade accelerometer here. And just from those two instruments, we see some interesting differences in the ground motions between the valley edge and the valley center. So this was really encouraging. We plan to go back in January of 2019 to get those additional eight units installed around the Kathmandu Valley. And you can imagine how frustrating it is when you gain momentum on something and then you immediately have to stop. However, there are other projects uh, like the seismology at school in Nepal project uh, led by Shiva Subedi. He's doing an awesome job. Okay, moving on to Myanmar. To give you an idea of the scale we're looking at here, Myanmar is about the same area as Oregon and California. This is a nice shortcut to think about the tectonics because we have a huge subduction zone and a major strike slip fault uh, near the country. So before January of 2016, the local monitoring agency had some stations, but it was really difficult to get real-time data, and if they went down, they had no money to fix them. Even if they had money, uh, the country is in a 71-year civil war, so there's a lot of places it's not safe for the government to go. Uh, USGS kicked off uh, an upgrade of the network with five new stations in 2016. Thanks to the work of a lot of awesome international partners, Myanmar is up to 21 permanent real-time stations currently. That means that they're able to automatically detect most felt earthquakes in the country down to about magnitude 3.0 near major cities. And we've already recorded several significant events, including two magnitude, <coughs> sorry, 6.8 earthquakes right after the installation of the network. DMH is starting to produce shake maps for earthquake response. We're incorporating the uh, instrumental observations, compiling them into a flat file, and starting to make interesting observations like it looks like Myanmar could be a really high attenuation environment. A lot of the work that I've been doing over there uh, involves training their staff. When they get new junior staff coming in, they have no training in seismology because there is no undergrad or grad program in Myanmar that teaches seismology. But they have solid backgrounds in other sciences and they're really fast learners. I want to finish by thanking Sue Huff for being the best postdoc supervisor ever. Uh, and thank you so much to all of my colleagues in Myanmar and Nepal for a very uh, challenging and adventurous and productive three years. Thanks. Thank you, Emily. Science that really matters. That's great. Next speaker. I'm live. Is Tim, he's, he's live. You ready, Tim? Ready. Go. So I'm talking about an, uh, essentially a new way of doing global seismic monitoring, which is using GPS or global navigational satellite systems. Uh, this is our little group at CWU. We've been on this for maybe 10 years now. We have an operational system that is running on most of the stations in the western United States. So if you think of what GPS normally does, we, you know, we dial up a, a station in the old days, download a day's worth of data, position it, do this year after year, fit a, fit a function to it, and then plot it and get an inner seismic deformation field. But if you actually look at the instrumentation on the west coast, there's 1,100 stations, and they're all live streaming, real time available. So the data rates are incredibly low when you look at what GPS is actually delivering. It's roughly 100 bytes per second. And so from anywhere in the United States, we can get data into CWU and get it positioned in less than half a second. So that thing on the left is a, a histogram of our time. And if you ask how many of these epics can we actually position uh, within five seconds, it turns out it's 93%, and if you go out 15%, you get more like 98%. And how well can we do it? Well, we can do about three, four, and five centimeters, one sigma in the northeast and vertical component. So we're not where we want to be, and like everything, we have big problems, but we can certainly tell you the difference between a seven or a six, or an eight and a seven, or a nine and a six, or depending. If you look at the greater US, uh, well, that's just most of the stations run by UNAVCO and the Plate Boundary Observatory and the Network of the Americas, but the proliferation of GPS globally is astonishing. So this is uh, the New Zealand network. There's about 50 that are uh, installed and 30 that are real-time telemetered. Um, and again, in cyberspace, the location doesn't really matter, so we get their data also and positioned in less than half a second. That's Australia's, uh, Australia's Geosciences Network. Um, same thing, the data is available instantly. And so given a lot of the drivers of GPS are not science, it's actually commercial land surveying, if you look at every station that's ever been installed and monumented, 
Uh, that's what you get. This is from the UNR lab, and there's 17,000, actually it's over now, 17,000 stations. And I say stations because most of these are not available to us in real time. But if you actually look at networks where we, CW, have an account and we can get data, the, currently the number is almost 3,000. And if we can get some negotiations, say, with Japan or with others, which are being pursued at high levels of government through the State Department, we'll, we'll double that number overnight. And so... In terms of what you get, most of you have seen this. This is, the, this is the finest GNSS network on Earth. It's Japan's GeoNet, and that's the station density. It's about 2,000 stations, and it should click. In, and you know this is the 2011 Tohoku earthquake, which there's a one-meter scale bar. So the coastal stations there move five meters. Uh, and if you actually take the t east component of those time series and plot them in record section format, which will come up right there, what you can see, so on the left is the amount of displacement, on the right is the distance of the station from the hypocenter. You can see the ones down at the bottom there, they all moved five plus meters, and they did that in less than two minutes. So if you're paying attention to this, you can see that that, that thing was a nine in two minutes, which is a big improvement. Another example is Kaikoura from uh, 2016. This was in a pathologically complicated earthquake that started on land, strike slip, jumped a dozen or two named faults, eventually turned into a uh, dip slip component, and when it went off the coast, uh, it actually produced dip slip of the ocean floor and produced a, a, a tsunami that reached up to a five meter run up height, okay? Not something you'd expect initially from a point source of a strike slip mechanism on land. But if you look at the GPS from New Zealand, the vertical motion on the right is you can see very quickly that uh, they recorded in excess of a meter of offset. And while their network was there, uh, they weren't monitoring it, but they're about there. And so by getting these data, so this is where we're aiming for this summer is to actually ramp up all 20 800 stations that we have access to right now. And our software, we, we're pretty sure, is capable of doing that. And then this is the limit. Um, maybe a third of these are, if we had total diplomacy on our side, we could bring these in. And if you look at where the earthquakes are and where we can get data, there is a lot of overlap. Obviously, there's a lot of missing things, but this is a new tool. Uh, so, and it's coming, and we'll be able to get these stations almost anywhere in the world you know, within a second or two. So just to leave you as a welcome to all of you to Washington State, I wanted to leave you with arguably the prettiest uh, GNSS station ever built. This is if you go out of the hotel to Seward Street, turn left and look down over Pike Place Market to, to the Olympic Mountains if they come out. This is station SCO3, which is part of UNAVCO's Play Boundary Observatory Nucleus thing. It's out there. It's telemetering data. Have at it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tim. GNS, yes, we enjoyed that presentation. I'm here all week, genuinely. Um, and next, we're going to move on to Men Andrin Meyer. Are we ready? Uh, have to be, I guess. You have to be. And um, go. So, earthquake early warning is the art and the science of outrunning seismic waves, like the guy on top. You know, some people also fear that it is maybe a gateway drug to seismology. Um, <laughs> In an ideal world, we wouldn't, ha we wouldn't need early warning because we could just predict earthquakes. Um, but while the internet has it that chimpanzees and your dog are really good at this, we seismologists are not. Um, and so we do what I like to refer to as sort of the next best thing to prediction, and that's monitoring the seismic situation in real time. And when we see that something significant is going on, we can send out alerts to sites before they get hit by uh, strong ground motion. And that could be really useful because a lot of the uh, damage and risk mitigation actions can be executed in a matter of seconds. So for example, if you're a surgeon, you can just take the knife out, or if you're working with dangerous chemicals, you can put them back uh, and take a step back to safety. Universal Studios is one of our test users. They want to stop the roller coasters at the bottom of the looping rather than at the top. Um, in the US, we've been working on a system called ShakeAlert, which is a US West Coast-wide system. It's been in development since 2006. Um, we're now live, at least in Southern California, hopefully soon also up here. Um, we have a phone app for LA, and we have over 60 uh, pilot test users. The idea goes back actually to 1868, believe it or not, um, from what was then called the Great San Francisco Earthquake, when a medical doctor called J.D. Cooper suggested that we could just put um, on the outskirts of the city a very simple mechanical contrivance that would be triggered by incoming seismic waves, and that contrivance would then in turn trigger the earthquake bell that is hung in the middle of the city. 
Um, and ever since then, we've been trying to develop and design this very simple mechanical contrivance. Um, so why is it taking us so long? Why is this so difficult? Well, it turns out that it's a little bit more complicated than this gentleman Cooper thought. For one thing, seismic waves are extremely fast. S waves travel, uh, as you know, with 12,000 kilometers per hour. Um, the hardest hit sites are the ones close to the epicenter, typically. They get hit first, um, so we have the least time. There's noise signals that we can mistake for earthquakes and create false alerts. There's all sorts of reasons why this could be difficult. But of course, we're not doing this because it's easy. Um, we're doing this because we think it's important. And so a lot of people have been working very hard to make this work. And we've been you know, improving algorithms, developing new algorithms, using deep learning, densifying the networks, and you name it. So with all our best efforts, how well does this actually work? Um, one way for us to find out is to replace large historic earthquakes, um, like we did in this study in Japan, where we've just taken the largest 200 earthquakes from Japan, and we replay the data and measure how well we did in terms of earthquake early warning. Um, so we reprocess all these data, and we can ask questions like, how often did we alert correctly? How long were the warning times that we could provide? And one statistic that I personally find uh, particularly uh, insightful is the distribution of warning times for sites that we should have alerted. And that's what's shown here in an empirical cumulative distribution function, uh, specifically for sites that only had light ground motion. So the way to read this is that about 50% of sites had warning times of 20 seconds and longer, and the other 50% had less warning time. If we look at stronger ground motion, we have less warning time, and we have a higher fraction of sites that we could not alert at all. Those are the 20% on the top, um, either because we were too slow or because we underpredicted the ground motion, so did not alert. Now, if you look at the sites that really matter, the ones with very extreme, violent, severe ground motion, um, the warning times are even shorter. And so if we think that we need maybe at least five seconds to do something useful, we can say that we can successfully alert anywhere between a quarter and half of those sites that are most crucial, but also most difficult. Now, obviously, this is far from perfect. We would like that to be 100%. We would like the warning times to be longer. But this is also the sites that do get the warnings will very much appreciate it. And if you think about finding yourself, oh, sorry. So I would argue the glass is half full, or at least a quarter full, because there's a lot of applications for which these alerts are good enough. Um, there's also a long list of applications for which the alerts are not good enough and that we'll never be able to do. But if we find ourselves in this situation and we can choose between having a seven seconds heads up or no heads up at all, I'm pretty sure we'll all be happy to take the seven seconds. And so I think my bottom line message here is that earthquake early warning is far from perfect, but it really works. Um, and it is arguably one of the sharpest risk mitigation tools that we can provide to the general public. These are alerts that are really actionable, something that really make a difference in the case of an emergency. And we do not have a lot of these things to offer to the general public as a community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Min Andrin. I'm not going to be able to unsee that eyeball. Um, <laughs> Don't you wear a helmet at Home Depot? David Wald <laughs> is about to throw down. You ready, David? Let's go. All right. Men showed that it's very difficult to get a, a, a long warning, especially when you have strong shaking. But it also takes time to get that warning to people, the communication time and the time to react. So it's even more challenging than, than we have led people to believe. Quick quiz. How long does it take to slow BART down, the train from 70 to 40 miles an hour, to duck, cover, and hold, to message uh, millions of cell phones? These are all times that, that are going to slow down and expand the size of our blind zone. 10 seconds, 5 seconds, 3 seconds. These are all precious seconds that we have. Early warning is amazing. There's a lot of great applications. A lot of people in the audience here are working on Finder and Plum and all sorts of neat stuff. It's a great science. Men's work with showing the uh, limitations of early warning and Sarah Minson's all great stuff. But I'm a little concerned that we've been overselling this stuff. Here's our best and brightest and our best communicators looking and saying how much we can do with early warning. And, uh, and they're doing it directly through the media and through the public. So I'm a little concerned that we may be selling, overselling this, this work. And Plato said it best when he said that the parent of an inventor or an art is not the best judgment of the the utility of his own inventions. He said this 2,000 years ago, and that's a quick sketch I did on the left of, uh, of Plato and Aristotle on the right. I couldn't find anything online. So the, the big message that we've been putting out there is that we can reduce fatalities, save lives, reduce injuries, and 
protect property. And I'm a little concerned that we may not be able to sell that. In fact, we may not, may not be able to accomplish that. The challenge is, of course, that uh, we've been overselling this. In this uh, example here in my shake, I think we've got a little carried away with the protein shake. And then, of course, we've got the shakeout beer, which is actually quite good. But my concern is that we're going a little too far on the promotional campaign. So the question is, if you add a couple seconds to the alert, and this latency is not part of, of the warning system uh, in terms of the alert time, you add a few seconds to communicate it and you add a few seconds to respond, suddenly you have a blind zone that's expanding. I'm going to show you how that works. So keep in mind that it takes a few seconds to drop, cover, and hold. It takes time to hear the alert. It takes time to recognize the alarm. It takes time to decide to act and then to act, typically about five seconds or longer for most people, according to this work by Keith Porter. So we're going to take that time, and we're going to add it to the alert. This is for Japan, JMA's alert. The, early, the inner ring is the blind zone for this particular earthquake. This is a magnitude 5.4, killed five people and injured many at the epicenter in the red. And so if you add two seconds to communicate to cell phones, suddenly you have a blind zone that's a little larger. It's a dash dot circle. And then if you add five seconds to respond, suddenly you have a blind zone that's the size of the shaken area. So this is a challenge, particularly for small earthquakes and, and deadly earthquakes like this. As you get to larger earthquakes, the challenge doesn't go away because it takes a little longer to determine the size of the earthquake. So now you have an inner ring that's the blind zone, the absolute blind zone for the alert. You've got two seconds to get to cell phones, and that's kind of generous because it's, it's usually slower than that. And then you have a zone between uh, zero and five seconds where you have barely time to respond. You can go back and do this historically. You look at the Northridge earthquake, the inner, uh, inner zone there with the dotted line is the uh, alert, absolute alert time, two seconds to get to cell phones, which is very generous in the US, and then five seconds for this, this latency um, in terms of response time. So you basically have a blind zone that's effectively larger than the area that had fatalities, serious injuries, or injuries. So it's a very difficult problem when you have these crustal earthquakes. The, um, I'm going to hit myself. So the good news is, of course, offshore earthquakes have much more time. And for Tohoku, for instance, you had about 15 seconds of warning on the coast. And here in Seattle, in Portland, we're going to have the same type of longer warnings and time to respond. That's awesome. The challenge is that when you go to California, it looks more like the crustal faults in Japan. Japanese know that for crustal earthquakes, you can get almost no warning. But for offshore earths, earthquakes like Tohoku, it's, it's a great situation. Unfortunately, California is littered with onshore faults, and you have very little time. So to amplify that, the, the shaking from crustal earthquakes is a lot stronger than it is for offshore earthquakes because the distance to the fault. So once again, it's amplifying the problem and giving us less time to, um, to take action. So I'll summarize by saying that communicating more frankly about earthquake early warning and the utility of, um, and, and timeliness is something that we need to do. We need to portray the warning times with this extra dimension for the user-relevant latencies and recognize that in California, we're not going to have offshore earthquakes. We're going to have these crustal earthquakes. So one thing we can do is take early warning off this pedestal of, of doing all things and put it in the context of all the other great things that we do in terms of mitigating and responding to earthquakes. And so we can have a complete package of earthquake information rather than just warning. And as I quote Brett Stevens from the New York Times, the reason that technology often disappoints and betrays us is that it promises to do things that by their very intrinsic nation, nature uh, have to be hard. Thank you. Thank you, David. So you had me at beer, so I need to go and add shakeout to my tsunami evacuation kit, Growler. Um, and we're now going to move on. Uh, humor, ironic, given I'm on the stage right now. Sarah McBride, are you ready? I am. OK, go. When I was a public information manager in Christchurch in 2001, I witnessed something remarkable. Now, you might be thinking it was the earthquake, or the impacts, or the rescuers who did amazing things saving people's lives or communities coming together. And those were indeed amazing, but actually it came from a media press conference that I was working on with the mayor of Christchurch. And he had to explain to everyone that, that the sewage system of Christchurch was broken and everyone in Christchurch was gonna get a chemical toilet. And then he proceeded to show everybody what people were going to have to do for the next four months of their lives, illustrating somewhat graphically, on stage. And the entire press corps cracked up laughing, as did a lot of Christchurch when they saw this picture. And we received comments from all over Christchurch saying, thank you, I haven't laughed in weeks. 
I really needed the break, and I appreciate what you've done. So when I became a social scientist, um, it got me to ask a lot of questions around whether we, as scientists, can actually ever be funny in times of crisis to provide people a little bit of relief or a little bit of joy. And when is that appropriate? And who can be funny? And what is funny and what is not? And so I started researching. Now, I would just want to say, if someone has said to you or has never said to you, you're funny or laughed at one of your jokes, a crisis is not the time to find that out. <laughs> and please do not come up to me and ask me if you're funny after this presentation. So this is some of the human, uh, humor research that I looked at. And what we found is that there's both, uh, both um, physiological and social benefits to humor. When we're underneath times of great pressure or stress, our bodies, our brains, release two major hormones, cortisol and adrenaline. And that helps us do all kinds of amazing things. It helps us stay alert, it helps us stay active, but we cannot sustain that level of stress forever, just ask any postdoc. So we need a release. Now some people need to cry, and crying is a natural thing, but scientists hate crying, so that's out. And then there's fighting, or physical activity. And I think scientists kind of like fighting, but some people feel a little bit uncomfortable about that. So the most socially acceptable thing is laughter. And laughter helps us release these hormones. But laughter actually has another fascinating byproduct. It also helps connect us socially. Have you ever heard of gallows humor? Or met you know, emergency managers or people who work at hospitals and they have this great laugh with each other? Humor can connect all of us. Now, what kind of scientists can be funny and is acceptable to be funny? Well, what I found is that the scientists that have the best shot at being funny are our local scientists who are known in the community, like Lori Dangler or Mark Quigley in Christchurch. They're respected, they're known, and their humor would be acceptable. The further you are from a community, the less likely you can be acceptable as being funny. So, humor is all about timing. <laughs> so when is too soon? Too soon uh, in Hurricane Sandy was plus or minus eight days. People were no longer under threat and they felt they could relax. Now what can we be funny about? Well, self-deprecation, the making fun of oneself at laughing at your mistakes is probably one of the easiest and best ways to be funny. Now, other forms of humor are situational humor. When people take a moment to say, this situation is a bit crazy, and let's all have a little bit of a laugh at it. So in Christchurch, again, they had a, a show us your long drop competition, where the best temporary toilets competed each other to win the prize in New Zealand. And this was an answer to the mayor back then. And so everyone had a great laugh. Now, what humor is unacceptable? Making fun of people's race, religion, or excluding others is never acceptable. You never want to make people feel worse at a time of crisis. So I would not suggest that. I admit that there are times where the cost, the human cost is so high, we can never be funny. And that's not appropriate. But in the right time, with the right person, in the right place, humor can be a wonderful tool that provides empathy, compassion, and community. And having said that, as, a, as reading all the social science literature, which scientific uh, discipline is the funniest? Well, that's easy. Chemists, because they always get a reaction. Thank you very much. I'll be here all week. That was great. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. A primer of humor research. Got to publish in that someday. Maybe Simon should. You ready, David? This Let's talk, find out. This talk, I can't even, I don't even know how to introduce this thing. <laughs> okay. You ready? Yeah. Go. If you've ever tried marijuana, please raise your left hand. <laughs> if you've ever had milk, please raise your right hand. Okay. About 50 years ago, President Nixon started a war on drugs, and he hired this fellow, Robert DuPont to essentially manage this war. Now, DuPont was a lawyer, not a scientist, but he made the statement that marijuana has proven to be a gateway drug because the vast um, majority of heroin users 
have used marijuana. And Nancy Reagan, uh, a little bit later, um, the, uh, the first lady under uh, President Reagan's domain, didn't catch the irony in that last statement. Um, but she did something constructive for school children about how to react to marijuana at school. She came up with this famous statement, just say no. Well, George Carlin, a comedian, did catch the irony. And he said, why settle for a vast majority? He said, if you change marijuana to mother's milk, then you have a 100% relationship between heroin users and their history, and you know everything you need to know. So um, I, I think it showed a, a kind of a logical problem that can be solved by quantitative methods. There's a great book I recommend to you, The Drunkard's Walk, which deals with that. And one of the items he discusses is the prosecutor's fallacy. An example goes something like this. A robber robbed a bank and stole a lot of money. Your Honor, this suspect has a lot of money. Therefore, it's probable that she was the robber. So it, by putting these two things together, I think it illustrates the, the logical problem. It can best be understood with a contingency table. And if you look at the red box there, oh, a contingency table on the top has marijuana and non-marijuana users, on the left-hand side, heroin and non-heroin users. The red box shows only heroin users. So that's a condition in this probability. And on the left side is those who use marijuana and the other, those who didn't. Much better way to find out whether marijuana has an effect on later heroin use is to look in the blue box. That is, ask the marijuana users. Well, uh, DuPont only used the red box. He didn't consider us bottom dwellers who haven't um, sampled heroin. So obviously it's not the right way to go about this kind of a problem. But getting the contingency table is the right way to go about it because then you can see what, what the effects are. And we can uh, put in George Carlin's experiment and uh, put in numbers that are appropriate to milk instead of heroin. And you get the fact that uh, you get this 100% relationship that Carlin wanted. Um, but this should be compared with the 2% prediction ratio you get if you only ask the marijuana users, did they graduate into heroin? So the conditions are very important. And what I would call this change is a condition swap. And you can see condition swaps and hear them if you listen to the radio with the, with the uh, right perspective. Uh, you can uh, see them in the newspaper, and you can see them at the SSA. Some of my favorites uh, start with something like this. Seven out of eight of the biggest earthquakes in some region were preceded by an electrical anomaly of some kind. And I hear heroin and mother's milk when I, when I hear those things. Another example has to do with the stress effects of main shocks. This map comes from a recently published paper. The red zone is the stress zone from a main shock. The little black uh, spots on there, the fly specks, are aftershocks of that. And the statement is made that the aftershocks are occurring in the red zone as they should, and they do. But what's not answered in that is what else happens in the red zone. Where are the earthquakes that were supposed to happen, and they aren't there? So we have a logical problem and real scientific problems uh, to deal with. Um, I have three recommendations for this. Uh, first is get that contingency table. The second is get that book, The Drunkard's Walk. And the third is follow Nancy Reagan's advice, and you can see it there on the T-shirt. Thanks. OK, thank you, David. Am I allowed to put both my arms down yet, or do I have to keep them up? I'm sorry. Okay. So last, but most definitely not least, uh, we have uh, Bruce Bannett. Bruce, ready to go? Um, I'm so ready. So ready. So okay. Ready. Yeah. Okay. So if you uh, don't understand the vaudeville reference here, just Google Carnegie jokes. Um, if uh, and, and so I actually gave most of this presentation at the SSA about 
10 years ago, which just goes to prove that, that slow motion train wrecks never get old. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about planetary seismology and, and its sorted history. So, so at the dawn of, of planetary exploration, uh, seismology was king. Basically, everything that we threw at another planet had a seismometer on it. And this went on for like 15 years uh, up through uh, 1977 and Viking. And there was a lot of support for seismology going forward. And those, these are a bunch of uh, uh, National Academy and NASA studies over the years, um, all the way up to the present, which all said seismology on Mars is something we need to do. But for some reason, there's like a 35-year hiatus between uh, the Viking land, uh, the Viking seismometers in 1977, which is kind of the end of, the, of, of this era, and, and, and InSight. And what, what's with this big gap? Well, it wasn't actually for lack of trying. There, there's actually a lot of attempts in the middle of there to, to, to actually get some seismometers uh, on Mars. And uh, I'm going to just kind of go through uh, some of these uh, assorted details in, in this talk. And so uh, the first one there is Mars 96. It was a, a Soviet slash Russian mission, depending on which side of the, the boundary you're on. It had uh, a, 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 some optimism uh, seismometers, which are French, and some, some other Russian seismometers. This was a, 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 you know, several tons of stuff going to Mars. Uh, unfortunately, uh, they launched it. The, rock, the upper stage failed. Um, it fell into the ocean off, off the coast of Peru, and uh, there was uh, never, never recovered. Okay, so the next thing that happened is, is sort of a, in, in parallel. In, in uh, the United States, uh, George H.W. Bush uh, declared that, you know, we have a, this uh, uh, exploration, space exploration initiative, and we're going to go to Mars, and blah, 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 and then the, the, uh, the, once they, they got the price tag, um, that went down the tubes. Uh, it was replaced by a, a, another uh, a mission concept called Measure. It's, this is 16 uh, landers going to Mars with seismometers and some other stuff. This went on for about six years. NASA was really serious about it. Um, uh, eventually, it was actually killed by a meteorite. Oddly enough, uh, there was a, a, a meteorite which was, was discovered, which had what some people thought were, you know, fossils in it. Suddenly, you know, NASA became the biology agency, and geophysics was out the window again. So this is the only time actually a uh, planetary mission has been destroyed by a meteorite. It turns out. Um, uh, so, so while Measure was going on, uh, we had parallel things going on in Europe. There's a lot of interest in planetary seismology in Europe. There's something called uh, MarsNet. Um, it actually was a little bit too expensive, and they couldn't get it together with NASA, so it didn't make it. But the next round with ESA, they sort of reproposed it as InterMarsNet and got a good collaboration going with NASA. NASA was going to, to launch these things. They had uh, a, a, a lot of uh, 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 synergy, but uh, right at the very end, when, the, when NASA was supposed to stand up and, and, and vouch for it, um, they pulled out because of the, 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 the meteorite thing. And so uh, a little bit later, there was something called NetLander. NetLander was actually a network of four stations um, that was uh, a proposed a joint thing between uh, NASA and, and CNES. Um, it started out as something that was going to fly on an ESA mission called uh, Mars Express, but uh, is predictably uh, the, the order of mass growth made it too, too massive and, and they got kicked off. But it was almost a, a immediately picked up uh, by the, the, the French uh, US uh, mission to go and, and do a sample return kind of around uh, 2000. Um, but, but after a few years, NASA canceled this part because of uh, uh, a bunch of failures in the Mars program. They, they went in a different direction. France tried to maintain this for a while with, with their own program um, as part of their mission to Mars, which was also extremely expensive. Uh, it was got canceled, and eventually, uh, without a ride, the, the, the net lander mission just kind of uh, withered away. Um, and one more attempt about uh, 2003, uh, there was a geophysical package that was supposed to fly on the ExoMars lander. Um, included uh, a lot of the stuff that we have actually have on InSight. It was canceled about three times and it finally stuck, and that's okay, the mission hasn't even launched yet anyway. Uh, and, and of course, and during this time, um, I'm shoveling out proposals about as fast as I can, and uh, most of these I'm glad they didn't get selected because uh, they probably wouldn't have worked, but um, they kind of built up to the InSight mission. So the moral of this story is if you have a legitimate, legitimately good idea, and it has to be a good idea, you need to keep trying to make it work over and over and over again. And once you've uh, run out of all the ways to screw up and fail, the success is the only option. So thanks. Thank you, Bruce. That was so depressing and then so inspiring. 
Um, so speakers stand up. Let's give them a round of applause. Well done. And thank you all for coming. Uh, let's see you again next year.